Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Skywatcher What's Up webcast and the first episode for 2021. I hope you all had a relaxing holiday season and were able to, you know, hang around the house like we've always been doing. Um, but uh, thanks for joining us uh, again for a brand new year, and we've got a lot of cool stuff planned for 2021. And all kinds of different episodes coming up. So uh, we definitely appreciate you jumping in with us last year, and now we're gonna continue on uh, for 2021. Um, yep, I got rid of some of the hair as well. I got tired of it being in my face uh, for a long time. And actually, if you look right there, this little notch there, that's not a scar. I was working on a mount, my hair got stuck in the gears, and it ripped it out of my scalp, so off went the hair, so uh, note to self. So anyway, getting started with uh, today's topic, it's January, and of course the first episode that we do for every month now is What's Up for the Month, um, and this will kind of show you some of the cool objects that are out and visible for this month and what you can see in your telescope and give you some ideas to do some viewing and imaging and tips for those particular objects as well. So uh, let's get started. And of course, um, on top of that, if you enjoy this webcast and you want to keep up with any of the future uh, content that we're coming out with, because we're starting to post some of the 2021 schedule uh, moving forward, you're going to want to be subscribed to the channel because you'll be able to see that uh, when they get posted. You'll see what's coming up. So if you like what we're doing here and you want to be a part of it, go ahead and subscribe to the channel. It helps us grow and, of course, keeps you up to date with what's going on. So uh, that is the Skywatcher USA YouTube channel. Um, if you have any questions or comments or anything related to the webcast, you can also email us at support at skywatcherusa.com and title your email, what's up, um, and just tell us what you're looking to see and what we should cover. So, um, we had a lot of cool stuff in 2021, and now we're kind of segueing into a brand new year, and there's a collection of cool stuff, but January's not really got a lot going in for it, but there's a couple cool things to check out at the moment. Um, both for photography and imaging. But first off, we're going to start with, of course, the moon, being that it is the brightest and easiest thing to see in the nighttime sky. Um, if you got a telescope for the holidays um, and you want to get out and start viewing, uh, the moon, I'm sorry, the moon um, is a great object to get started with, but it's not currently visible in the evening. So, New moon for January, where there is no moon in the sky, that's the darkest part of the month, is January 13th, which is like right in the middle of next week. So the, we actually have two pretty good weekends uh, to catch uh, some dark skies. So this weekend, the 9th and the 10th of January, is going to be the darkest uh, weekend for the month. Uh, we do have a crescent moon, but it is rising in the early morning, so uh, for the majority of the night, um, it is going to be dark. So if you're getting out to dark skies, cold skies, um, being that it's in the middle of winter, um, this is the weekend to get out. Now, if you can't make this weekend, we do have next weekend, which is the 15th and 16th. And with that, uh, we have a small crescent uh, that's visible in the early evening, but as uh, the night progresses, that moon is going to dissipate and give way to nice dark skies. So there's kind of two opportune weekends uh, to get out this month and really, um, really get that going. Oh, I'm sorry. My face is in the way. My apologies. Normally it's on the other side. Here, let me transition this. Shrink it real quick. Sorry about that, guys. There we go. That should be better. Normally it's on the right side. I'm not sure why it's over there on the left. Anyway, um, just a recap since I was covering it up. Uh, new moon for this week or this month is January 13th. Uh, the dark darkest uh, weekend of the month is the 9th and 10th, so this weekend. And then of course uh, the following weekend, uh, 15th and 16th, we have a crescent. 
um, in the early evening, which will give way to dark skies. So there are two optimal weekends to get out this month to those dark sky sites if you're looking to catch an awesome image or just do some observing with friends. I know I've got a big chat going on with my friends right now on my phone uh, about who's going out to what site this weekend. So uh, this is uh, the dark weekend of the month. Now, with that, if you just got your telescope and you wanna start, I know there's a lot of people that have questions they're getting started in astronomy because they got their first telescope over the holidays. Um, the full moon, uh, apologies on that real quick. Um, on here, I think that's right. Let me double check something. Oh. Typo on my, the, the full moon for this month, I'm sorry, is January 28th. The slide is incorrect, so just uh, ignore that. But it is known as the wolf moon. And the full moon for January gets its name because most of the Native Americans uh, or a couple different tribes around, uh, I think today, sorry, first day back, um, built the folklore around this moon because a lot of times deep in the winter, they would hear the wolves howling at the moon uh, at this time because they were either hungry or there wasn't much to, for them to feed on at this time of year. So that's where it gets its name. Uh, that is the January full moon, which is on January 28th, not the 13th. So ignore what I've got up on the slide right there. That was supposed to be changed and I missed it. So I apologize. Um, so January 28th is the full moon. It is the wolf moon is the name that it has. But some other names that you'll probably see are the cold moon and the freeze up moon. Uh, these uh, different nicknames that the full moon get come from different regions so if you go to different regions and especially if you were to go around the world i'm sure they would have different uh, names to cover that particular moon uh, full moon for that month so it's just kind of some of the folklore that comes around uh, when there's a full moon so january 28th is the full moon um, the week or two before january 28th is when we'll start getting the moon into the nighttime sky and if you've got a new telescope that you just got for the holidays um, as we move into the next couple weeks, we'll start getting the moon into the evening sky, and that'll be great for getting that telescope out and really stretching its legs to see what you can do with it, um, because the moon is a great object to actually explore with pretty much any sized optic. So even a camera lens does a really nice job, but a small telescope is a great way to do it. Now the planets. We're kind of in a weird transition time with the planets right now. And we're getting some emails about this from people on our support email. A lot of I've gotten some conversations where I got my telescope and I'm getting really disappointing views of the planets. So we're going to discuss that in this section right now because it's not the scope. Um, so we have six visible planets right now in the evening. Uh, Mercury has joined our uh, collection of planets in the west um, over the over the month, it's actually going to start rising. Uh, but we have Mercury, Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, Mars, and Uranus in the evening sky. Um, and you can catch Venus in the early morning sky is real bright. But right now we're just doing the evening. So Mercury um, is a little bit of a tough object to see. Um, for the record, real quick, this is the best shot of Mercury I had. This was from the Mercury Transit last, uh, uh, 2019 uh, Mercury transit um, so that's that's the only image I had of Mercury for this um, and if you're ever looking at the Sun make sure you're using the right filters by the way uh, Mercury is really tough Mercury is small it's generally near the Sun um, it's never really in an optimal viewing spot in the evening um, I find the best time to actually view Mercury is during the day when it's straight overhead and that can be a little bit of a challenge because you have to make sure you know where you're pointing or that your go-to system is accurate because um, it's normally not too far from the sun. It does get far enough away to where it's not dangerously near the sun. And a lot of times it's actually far enough away to where you can safely view it during the day. But it's so small that it's challenging to find without the aid of electronic pointing assistance. So 
I find the best time to view Mercury is during the day when it's nice and high overhead. Uh, you can see Mercury in pretty much any sized optic, but if you want to start getting some nice, uh, there's not really any detail to see, but you can see the phases of Mercury just like Venus or the Moon. Um, any object within the Earth's orbit, Venus and Mercury, uh, allow you to see phases just like the Moon. So you can get out and see Mercury when it has like a crescent or Venus when it has a crescent. Um, but not sure what phase Mercury's in right now as it's rising in the evening sky, but it's rising in the west, and over the, the next few weeks, it's going to get higher and higher and higher and become easier to see um, just after sunset. So keep an eye on that. If you've got uh, an app on your phone, you can see where Mercury's going to be and how to find it and catch it there. But that's kind of a cool one to see. You can... Uh, you know, you can catch it in a 4-inch telescope, but a little bit bigger will help with that resolution and magnifying the whatever phase it's in right now. Um, it's, you have to check on that. I think because it is moving away and higher up in its uh, position in the sky, it's not going to be a crescent. It's going to be more illuminated, so it's going to look more like a ball. Um, and as it gets towards the sun, it generally turns more into a crescent. But something to check out. It's a fun planet uh, to... It on there if you're new to astronomy and you're trying to tick off all the planets on your checklist um, this is a good time to get mercury so mercury is now in the evening sky and it's a fun one to catch it it will be easier as we progress into the, the month a little bit more of course right now we still have Jupiter in the evening sky not much longer um, it looks fine in any size telescope. Uh, the Galilean moons can easily be seen. You have a very limited window on when you can actually see the planet, though. It's, it only is up for about an hour after sunset, so um, it's really not in a good spot to get the best views of it. But if you want to see it, you've got a clear horizon to the west. Uh, you can still catch it. It is very low, um, way down in the western horizon um area now because we just had the conjunction of jupiter and saturn last month the two are still they're not really close together but they're close enough in the same position of the sky that both of them are really kind of down in the soup of the western sky they're setting it's the end of the season um you could probably still get an okay view of it uh, you can probably still get some of the rings, um, but it's going to be far from optimal. Now, like I said earlier, I've had a lot of people emailing, calling in, saying, I just got my telescope, or I have this telescope, and I'm trying to look at the planets, and none of them are looking good. The reason is, for Jupiter and Saturn, they're really low. And generally, for some of you, this is probably a review, but when you're observing planets, you want them to be high up in the sky, you want them to be where the seeing is stable. When planets or any object starts to get lower and lower to the horizon, if you imagine the atmosphere is curved, when you're looking up, you're not looking through as much atmosphere as you are out. You're looking through this whole curve of the atmosphere when you're looking out towards the horizon. And because you have all that air and the heat from the day and particles and all the stuff that's basically going to diffuse the light, you're not getting a good view. It doesn't matter what telescope you use, it's just not in a good position. So a lot of times right now when I'm hearing people say, I can't get a good view of the planets, it's because the conditions that you're viewing those planets in are not good to support what you're trying to do. And especially if you're a beginner, you're throwing a lot of magnification on that, you're, you're amplifying that even more. So if you're trying to view Jupiter and Saturn right now and you're disappointed with the view, I'm nearly 99% sure it's not the telescope that you're using. It has everything to do with the environment at the moment for observing those planets. And you're just going to unfortunately have to wait um, probably a couple months for those planets to kind of rope back around the sun and get high enough up into the morning sky to where they'll be high enough for you to go view um, all that. So definitely that's what's going on with those two planets um, at the moment. 
Now, Neptune is still in the nighttime sky. You can catch it um, until around 9 p.m. It's kind of a fun one because it's more of a challenging planet to see. Um, it is the furthest planet in the solar system, but you can grab it in a 5-inch telescope. Uh, if you have a bigger telescope that's got more resolution and you can put some magnification on it, you can blow up the planet a little bit more to where you can start to see the blue sphere of, of uh, Neptune floating out there. It does look different than the stars in the star fields. All those will look like points where Neptune will look more pronounced as like a spherical um, object. So that's kind of a cool one to see. Um, if you want to get out, if you've, you've got a telescope for the holidays, finding or viewing Neptune is a good way to kind of stretch its legs. It's in a good position in the sky right now for the early evening. Um, but it does start to get low and lose it by just at around 9 p.m. So you've got probably two to three hour window of nice viewing for uh, Neptune right now. So Neptune's a great planet to get out and view right now as well. Um, you do need a five inch telescope, 130 millimeter aperture or bigger to really start digging into what you need. Um, but if you got a bigger telescope, it's it's a nice one to hunt down and it's another one that you can kind of check off the list of planets seeing uh, to observe right now. Mars is another planet that's in a actually great position right now. It is practically overhead at zenith after sunset. It is bright, it's, it's easy to find because it's that nice red color. Um, but it is moving away from us. We had opposition of Mars uh, back in the fall of 2020. So it's been moving away from us. And with enough magnification and a big enough telescope, you can still resolve some nice detail on it. Um, I say 80 millimeter on here. It's probably still possible to get a nice little image of it. Um, but if you want to get a better, more pronounced image of it, you're probably looking at something like 150 or bigger, or six inch is what that equates to, telescope for Mars. But it is moving away from us, and I've this is the other planet that people have been saying I can't get a good view of. Uh, reason being is because it's, it is moving away from us very quickly, so it's getting smaller as, the, as Earth and Mars move further apart in their orbits. Um, like I said, the best time to view this was in the fall of last year, and that's pretty much done. So you can get what you can from Mars right now, but we're going to have to wait and basically until next year to get a good view of Mars at the moment. So that's about it uh, for Mars. So if, if you want to catch Mars, you can still get a nice view of it, but do remember that it is moving away. Um, from us, so you should go into observing that planet with the expectation that it's not going to be optimal um, as far as positioning goes between the two, between Earth and Mars. Um, it is in a perfect position to view because it's nice and high, but unfortunately, it's further out. So you can still get a nice view. You might be able to get some of the darker details if you've got a large enough telescope and enough magnification, but you're gonna have to play with it. Um, it's been a little bit since I've observed it personally, so I'm not sure what the view is looking like right now, but I found when it was optimal, about 200X, you can get some nice uh, images of the planet. So you can probably still get some nice dark detail on it, but it's, it's, it is moving away with, from us, so it's getting smaller. And it's good to about uh, midnight, and then you then we lose it. So we are leaving the planet season um, at the moment because all the major planets are either not optimal or we're losing them uh, in the night sky. Now to wrap up the for the sixth planet in the evening sky right now is the planet Uranus. It's actually not far from Mars right now. It's nice and high after sunset. You can see it in an 80 millimeter or a three inch telescope. It is much easier to see than Neptune, even though it is still fairly far. It doesn't take a lot to actually notice that it is spherical. Um, Uranus, I think, is really neat uh, because, because it is one of those distant planets. It's not the major naked eye planets. It's, it's cool to be able to see 
that it does look like a planet even in a small telescope for how far away it actually is. So definitely a fun one to get out if you haven't seen it. It's kind of a fun one if you've already seen it too because you can just stop by and see how what's going on. But it's if you're out in the backyard, it's a great little uh, target to hunt down. And then again, you can just check that off the list of uh, the planets for observing the planet. So um, right off the bat, you could nail out six planets if you're new to astronomy, and so you've viewed all of them. It just you might not get what you're looking for on uh, Jupiter and Saturn. You're going to have to wait probably until. They are rising earlier in the evening and the next earlier in the morning in the next couple months or wait till summer of next of this year um, when they come back into the evening sky. So that's where we're at with that. Now, there's there are a couple of cool events with the planets that are coming up right now. On January 10th, so Sunday night is January 10th. We have another conjunction, essentially, is what it is. We have Jupiter, Saturn, and Mercury that are going to make this triangle of planets um, on Sunday. Now, you're going to need a very clear western horizon because it's a very limited window on when you're going to be able to catch the three together. Um, it's it's going to be limited because of where it's positioned at. So we'll see who can get shots of it. Um, but that's going to be something cool to see. Uh, I know the, because of how low it is, the planets themselves aren't going to look amazing it's, if you're using a big telescope to see them. But if you've got like a telephoto lens or some binoculars and you want to see the planetary triangle, um, Sunday night, January 10th, just after sunset, look to the west. Uh, you're probably going to want to see... You'll probably find Jupiter first because it will be the brightest. But when you put some uh, aperture on it, either with some binoculars or camera lens or a telescope, you should be able to resolve Saturn and Mercury to some extent um, there. So that'll at least be kind of a cool uh, shot to be able to get at that point. Moved around here. That's just supposed to be in front. Um, another cool event that's coming up, this one is better positioned. Uh, this is January 20th. We have... I am, my PowerPoint is all messed up this morning. I'm sorry. Um, let me just get rid of this. There we go. That's better. Uh, we have a conjunction, or as close as they're going to get, uh, between Mars and Uranus. Uh, this is January 20th. Uh, this is a 900 millimeter telescope um, with a 31 millimeter, 82 degree field of view eyepiece. So it will fit in the field of view of a lower power eyepiece at a 900 millimeter focal length. Uh, you can probably add a little bit more magnification to blow them out a little bit more. But Mars and Uranus will be able to fit in the same field of view. And you should be able to notice that they are both planets with just some basic magnification. Um, but you'll have to see what you can get. But that'll be kind of a cool uh, thing to see. You will need a telescope to catch this uh, conjunction. Uh, Mars will obviously be naked eye. Uranus, Uranus technically is naked eye visible but you need to be in very dark skies to see it. Um, and it just looks like a little dot. So if you've got a telescope, you should be able to catch this uh, pairing on January 20th um, as well. So some cool uh, collections of planets while we still have a lot of them visible in the evening. So something cool to check out and see. Now, the sun. The sun has been going off and really ramping up, but unfortunately at the moment, there's not much to see. Now, I haven't checked today. Um, let me check real quick while we're on here what's going on on the sun this morning. Um, if you have a, a solar telescope, like a hydrogen alpha telescope, and you want to see what's going on, um, I like to go to this website. Um, if you just go to Google and you type in gong, G-O-N-G, uh, H-alpha and just Google search that this will come up these are all fairly uh, it'll actually tell you the time that these updated uh, but this is kind of the current uh, view of the Sun and hydrogen alpha so uh, this is how I check if it's you know if there's something fun to go out and see so right now there's not much in the way of sunspots 
up on the sun right now but there's still been some good prominences and there's been some good filaments like let's look right now um so there's a nice prominence right there there's a couple little filaments there so there's some stuff that's visible um to see but you are going to need a hydrogen alpha telescope but the sun is very dynamic so it is something that you're gonna want to check out um, if you have a telescope a hydrogen alpha filter or hydrogen alpha telescope how just keep an eye on it because the sun is a constantly changing object so just because there's nothing happening right now um doesn't mean it's not worth uh checking out right now now i know there's a comment asking how far mars and uranus are going to be apart from one another on the 20th i'm checking that really quickly bear with me i'll get you that Okay, so on the 20th, Mars and Uranus will be 1 degree and 37 arc minutes apart from each other. So just under a degree and a half, roughly, is how far Mars and Uranus will be on the conjunction on the 20th. So they won't be super duper close, but they will be close enough to fit in a wider field uh, optic. Um, like I said, what I had earlier was... Basically, our Evo Star 120, um, 900 millimeter refractor, and a 31 millimeter eyepiece, and it fit within the field of view pretty uh, nicely. But we could add some more magnification and tighten up the field there. So there's there's definitely some different uh, optics and magnifications you can play with um, with something like that to see that conjunction on the 20th, and that's the Mars and Uranus conjunction. Okay, moving along, uh, meteor showers. We only had one meteor shower this month, and unfortunately, because we were not here last week, it's already passed. That was the quadrinids. Uh, this was January 2nd and 3rd. It's not really one of the bigger ones. It's about 40 meteors per hour, and you're probably best to see it in a dark sky. So um, I just wanted to bring it up because of clarity, um, but of course, it's already passed at this point so uh, but it wasn't one of the bigger meteor showers the biggest meteor shower usually of the year takes place in august and so at the moment we don't have there's some other good ones out there but the big ones in august is, as well as a couple others that we'll talk about as you know we cover each month i'll bring up what meteor showers are happening um but for this month it was just one and uh, it's one of the smaller ones as well so there's not not a whole lot going on for meteor showers this month. You can still catch shooting stars if you're out in a dark sky. Odds are you're going to see a couple of them. So just because there's not a meteor shower occurring doesn't mean you can't catch some shooting stars. If you're going out to dark skies this weekend and next, or even in your backyard, you can still catch some cool stuff. So always keep looking up, and you never really know what you're going to catch. So something to check out. All right, deep sky targets. Um, we're in the middle of winter right now, and there is a lot of the real classic targets uh, visible right now for viewing and astrophotography. So of course, one of the major ones right now is the Pleiades, M45. And I left a lot of these in from last month's overview because they are really popular, but we also have a lot of beginners um, that just got their first telescope. So I wanted to mix some of the easy stuff with a couple of harder things in here too. Um, so if you just got your first telescope or you've been doing this for years like myself, M45 or the Pleiades cluster in Taurus is just one of those old friends that you want to check out every time they come back around uh, in the winter time. Uh, Pleiades is really high after sunset. It's, it's not quite at zenith, but it's up there. You can get a really good view of it as soon as it gets dark. And the cool thing about the Pleiades is you can see it naked eye from most backyards. It's not a hard object to find, and it looks good in really any size telescope, especially wide field binoculars or like a four inch refractor, or let's say you got like a six or eight inch Dobsonian, will look good in all of those. It's a fun target to start digging into the deep sky uh, targets for this time of year. That's the great thing about winter in the Northern Hemisphere is a lot of people get their first telescope 
for the holidays. And right after that, you have a beautiful collection of really bright, easy targets to start observing with that telescope as soon as you get it together. The Pleiades is one of those. It's also very photogenic. So if you're trying to take some pictures, maybe you got a star adventure and you wanna bust out a 200 millimeter telephoto, it's a great object to see. It's really easy and really forgiving um, to view and photograph. And of course, if you get to darker skies, you can get some of the nebulosity that comes from the cluster a lot easier. It's got this beautiful blue sapphire look to it because of the stars that illuminate that reflection nebula in there. Uh, but the Pleiades is a really fun object to see. I never really get tired of it either. And the darker the skies you're at, the more stunning it gets because of just all the faint stars that reside in there. But it is a very cool object to see. Very easy to see. A pair of binoculars works great. Small telescopes are great. Um, you really want something that's wider um, to catch all of them in there. But it's a, a great object to get started. Um, it's a fun one if you've been doing this for a long time. And it's it's great for imaging uh, as well. If you are trying to image it from in town, you probably want to use like a light pollution, like something like an L Pro filter. Um, because it is a, it's an open cluster of stars and there's a the blue nebula in there, which is a reflection nebula. Um, those don't react to any of the nebula filters. It's a reflection nebula doesn't emit its own light. So there's no light you can isolate with a filter to really catch it. So that's something that you wanna remember if you're just starting astrophotography that the only filters that are gonna work with this are light pollution, red, green, and blue. Um, there's no narrow band option for this target. You just gotta hit it when the moon is down um, and use a light pollution filter if you're in town or just put some time on it with your your one shot color or monochrome camera with red, green, blue filters to make a color image from a darker sky. So um, that is M45, the Pleiades cluster or the Seven Sisters as it's affectionately known as well. Now, another favorite right now is the Rosette Nebula. And the Rosette is in a position right now, it's, it's in a constellation Monoceros, which is kind of between Orion and Gemini. And what's cool about this object is it does react to narrow band filters really well. Um, it's rising just after sunset. This is a object that you really need dark skies to see it visually. Um, if you're trying to view it visually, you probably want like a 100 millimeter wide field of view scope. Um, H-beta will probably bring out certain portions of it because it is a heavily based hydrogen region. Um, a UHC filter would work or an O3 filter. Um, so all three of the popular filters will work. If you're out viewing and you have all three, switch them out, see what it looks like. It's really cool to actually play with filters um, and see what exactly they do to each object. There's a lot of people that have an H-beta filter and they're just like, oh, it's just for the horse head. No, it's not. Um, it's effective for the horse head, but it's, it's a very cool filter to try on other objects as well. So go ahead and experiment if you've got the filters and see what it does to each nebula. But the Rosette Nebula is a phenomenal target right now. If you're doing astrophotography, the nice thing about the rosette from the position right now is once it gets dark, it's kind of high enough to start photographing. And you can pretty much go almost all night on this object at the moment. So if you need a lot of time on it, uh, over the next week or so is going to be a really good time to hit it because it's going to be uh, very little moon in the sky and you can pretty much sit on it all night as it you know crosses the sky. Um, the rosette, this is the time to really get some good uh, images off of it because you're able to sit on it for so long. The nights are really long and it's visible for pretty much the entire evening. You're going to need a huge field of view to catch it though. Um, the, tells, the image right here was taken with an Esprit 100 native focal length 550 millimeter with a full frame camera. 
Um, so it's a really large field of view that you're going to need for this. Um, I'd probably say big chips, big sensors, you know, crop sensor, four thirds, but something probably 500 millimeters and shorter at the moment is what you're going to need to get the whole field of view. Now the rosette's kind of neat because you have this particular region right here, the main region, but there's actually like a tail of hydrogen that follows it. So if you want to get that whole field of view, a camera lens almost is what you're going to need or these fast little refractors that are coming out um, to get that trail of hydrogen that uh, comes off of that uh, nebula there. But the rosette is very, very cool um, if, uh, for imaging. It's a great target. Um, the nice thing about it is because it is an emission nebula, where it emits its own light, it reacts really well to those narrow band filters. So what you see here, this is taken from a back my backyard um, with a hydrogen alpha filter. Um, so a hydrogen alpha filter is very effective if you can't get to dark skies, if you want to do some of those bicolor or Hubble palette images with narrow band filters, the rosette reacts really well to those filters. So get out and take a view of it or um, try to capture it because now is the optimal time to really catch the rosette nebula um, at the moment. Now not far from the rosette actually kind of next door neighbors is the cone nebula which is NGC 2264. Um, this is kind of a, this is in the constellation of Monoceros but it's right at the foot of Gemini. Um, it's not too hard to capture. And this is very similar to the rosette. It's rising just after the sun goes down. So if you're into imaging, you can pretty much hammer this target all night and get a really good uh, data set on it because of how long you can uh, photograph this, this region. Uh, it's visible from dark skies. You're gonna need some aperture on it. Again, try with the H beta UHC filters. Uh, O3 can also help. Um, with that but experiment with it it's gonna be faint it's it it's called the Christmas tree uh, cluster as well there's a lot of stars in this region so if you're doing it visually you're probably gonna notice there's gonna be a ton of stars in the region but you should be able to pick out some of the brighter nebulosity visually now photographically very similar to the rosette it reacts really well to narrowband images uh, I've seen some really amazing Hubble palette images with the hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur uh, filters and various combinations to get those really cool color images. But the Cone Nebula is a fantastic uh, nebula to catch. Uh, the image right here was actually taken with one of our EvoStar 80ED refractors. It's, it's not a big fancy imaging setup. It's a basic 80 millimeter refractor can get a really nice image with this. This is a hydrogen alpha filter, of course, but you can see how much details in there. It's a really cool object right now to image. And like I said before, the nice thing about it is because of where it's positioned and how long the nights are right now, you can get a lot of time on this object in one evening, especially over the next week or two when the moon isn't really uh, obtrusive in the, the nighttime sky. And if you are imaging in town, it reacts really well to those narrow band filters because it is also an emission nebula. So very cool target to see. Um, definitely try viewing if you're going to a dark sky site. It's kind of a fun challenge target, but for photography, it works really, really well um, for a lot of uh, imaging um, projects. So give that a go, highly recommend it. Doesn't take much to do it. Um, real basic telescopes, wide field refractors, camera lenses. This is a great region to go after right now. Now, if you're looking for galaxies, we still have the Triangulum Galaxy up right now, M33. It's visible high overhead. And this one's a little tough in town. Uh, you really want darker skies for this uh, galaxy because it's very low surface brightness but it's a fun one. It's not far from M31, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, take out your phone or your sky map and go check that out. But M33, if you're looking for some kind of galaxy um, right now, uh, this would be one of them to check out. Of course, you have Andromeda up as well, but 
that's kind of a given and real popular for people to see right now. So um, if you're looking for galaxies, there's not a lot of big galaxies up uh, right now. You have Andromeda, you have M33, a NGC 891. There's a couple good galaxies up right now. Um, but the winter time is really dominated by clusters and nebula, big wide field nebulas. Um, if you're into galaxies, spring is not far away and that's where the whole night sky is littered with really tiny little galaxies to photograph. But if you're into wide field stuff, now is the time to bust that stuff out because there's all kinds of hydrogen regions and really large nebulas that are visible in the sky right now. Speaking of Andromeda, Andromeda is a very cool galaxy to see. It's easy to photograph. It's nice and high in the nighttime sky right now. Um, we are going to start, it's going to start setting earlier and earlier because it's more of a fall object. So it's, it is very high just past Zenith right now um, as we get into this uh, later in the evenings, but it's going to start setting earlier and earlier as the month goes on as well. A lot of people look at Andromeda as a whole thing. They shoot it and they're on to the next target. The really cool thing about Andromeda though is if you can see on the screen there, there's all these little numbers over my image here. Those are all globular clusters. Um, Andromeda has a wide collection of globular clusters. Actually, um, of course, it's in the constellation of Andromeda. I'm sure you figured that out. But there's 509 globular clusters in the galaxy itself. Um, not all of them are visible. They are very challenging. So if you're looking for something off the beaten path that's really a challenge and you're going to dark skies with a 10-inch telescope or bigger, uh, try looking for some of these. The brightest one is called G1 or Mayall 2. Uh, that is the brightest of all of the clusters. There's a handful of other ones um, as well. Um, let me see if I can find this real quick. If you don't know what you're looking for, uh, you can go to Atlas, Google Atlas of Andromeda. It's actually a book, but the book's really hard to find. Um, but you can get all the, the PDFs of the charts um, online. So this is kind of a, a cool thing if you want to start hunting down globulars in the Andromeda galaxy, it is possible um, with doing it for some amateur equipment. Now as you get to the smaller ones, it's going to get progressively more difficult. But some of the, the major ones like G1 and um, some of the other ones are easily visible in like a 10, 11 or larger inch telescope. So. Something off the beaten path, a little bit more of a challenge, but that's the Atlas of Andromeda and the globular clusters inside Andromeda. Um, kind of a fun thing to do if you're going to be sitting on this for a while taking pictures. You can go through like I've done here and kind of map out some of those clusters, but it these don't come up in conversation too often. So if you kind of want to impress your friends and check some stuff out that's inside the galaxy itself, uh, check out the Andromeda cluster globular clusters. So definitely, definitely worth it if you're hardcore into deep sky, especially if you're into viewing. They're actually easier to view personally if you've got a bigger access to a bigger telescope. Especially if you're a big dob or have a friend who's got a big dob, um, have them track down some of these clusters and take a look at them. It's kind of neat to look at a cluster that's inside another galaxy. All right. Okay. So it's winter time and I couldn't skip over probably actually factually the most photographed object in the nighttime sky, which is the Orion Nebula. Everyone shoots this as you should. It's big. It's easy. It's colorful. And you can learn a lot about uh, viewing and astrophotography off this object. Um, you can easily catch it in light polluted skies. Even a camera phone nowadays will get you a nice uh, basic picture of it. A DSLR works really well, and pretty much any camera on the market will get you some good shots out of it. And from something as basic to a camera on a sky tracker to an advanced imaging setup, you'll get an awesome image of Orion 
pretty much no matter what you use. So that's M42, the Orion Nebula. It looks good in any size telescope. You can see the nebula from your backyard. Um, you know, it's hard to, to say anything. There's not really much to say negative about the Orion Nebula. It's just, it's easy. It's one of those where you're gonna get a nice shot to show your friends or impress your family with your new telescope by taking it out and looking at it. Um, binoculars, you'll start to see the nebula and the bigger the telescope you get, the more that nebulosity you see. Now, if you're making your way to dark skies, especially if you're doing it for the first time with your telescope, this is a really impressive nebula uh, because it really looks a lot different from a real dark location than it does in the city. Um, in the city, you can kind of see the core and some of this outer area near the core, but a lot of the outer wings and air, all of this detail are pretty difficult to see. Um, in town, but if you get to a dark sky with no filter, mind you, this really is stunning because you can see all kinds of detail. And the bigger the scope you've got, the more impressive it gets. Um, I know one. This is probably one of those objects where you hear people. I saw this in a 20-inch telescope, and it blew my mind. This is normally one of those objects that sticks. Um, I remember when I was younger going out to one of my first star parties. I think I had my 10 inch job at the time. There's a gentleman with a 25 inch telescope, got to look through Orion and that really set the precedent of wanting a big telescope because the image was just unbelievable. So Orion looks good in any sized optic and it just gets more and more impressive the bigger you go um, with it. Now, at the center of Orion, you have the trapezium, and the trapezium has a collection of, uh, what is it, 10, 11 stars, maybe a little bit more. Um, it's a little trapezoid kind of thing. Um, you can see it in most telescopes as four stars. You have A, B, C, and D. Those are the, the major stars of the trapezium. Uh, the next two dimmer stars are E and F. Those are the six, total of six stars that you can generally see. A lot of people use this as a optical test. Um, quite honestly, it's not really a challenge to see E and F. Um, okay seeing in a four inch refractor with some basic magnification will bring those out. So, um, but E and F, uh, if you're looking for a little bit more of a beginner challenge, the E and F stars um, are fun to see. But if you have a six inch telescope, you'll catch them on a decent night, every night for the most part. Um, the challenging ones are the ones after that. Um, so you have A, B, C, D, E and F, H, I, and I think it goes down to J. And I believe I, I'd have to look this up on a chart again, but one of those is actually a binary or at least an, an optical binary so there's two of them those are really difficult everything below the e and f stars is dim i mean we're talking 14th or 15th magnitude roughly you're talking limitations of a 16 inch telescope at that point so you're going to have to have probably at least a 20 inch and optimal skies to see some of the fainter companions of the trapezium which is the cluster at the center of the Orion Nebula, but it's a fun one to check out. And there's all kinds of cool little things in there. Um, don't be afraid to push some magnification on the core of Orion as well, because there's all kinds of cool things that'll come out um, and little details to see. So don't just throw a 31 or 30 millimeter eyepiece, look at it and then go on with your night. Spend some time, actually observe it, take it in. Um, I find a lot of people say, oh, I looked at it and then went on to whatever the next object is. There's a difference between viewing and observing. Observing, you want to sit there, watch the details. As you sit there, you'll notice there's a lot of subtle filaments and all kinds of interesting shapes and details to be seen in there. And if you just take five minutes to look at it and then pass over it, then you didn't really observe it too much. So while we've got it in a good position, Take a look at it, you know, spend some time on it. It's it's really got some cool stuff in there. And then of course, next door is the Running Man Nebula um, right here. So there's all kinds of cool stuff to see.
and it's really easy to photograph with pretty much anything. Um, to wrap this up real quick, the last one, of course, right next door is the Horsehead Nebula. Horsehead is really easy to photograph of pretty much any size. Uh, I think any lens about 50 millimeter and longer, um, you'll be able to catch it. So like a 50 millimeter camera lens, uh, 200 millimeter works really good. Um, but visually, if you're trying to see the horse head, it is a challenge. It's like a black thumbprint on black tablecloth. I would say you probably need at least an eight inch, probably most likely an H beta filter, a UHC you could squeak by with. Um, but it's a challenge visually, but very easy photographically. Uh, if you just got your basic imaging set up together, maybe you got a star tracker, uh, try shooting this from the backyard. You could probably get it. Um, it's by the Bright Star Almatac, uh, the bottom part of the Orion belt. Uh, so now is the time to catch that as well. It's a very beautiful object to see. It's very easy photographically, but very challenging for imaging. And if you're just getting started, you see this image a lot. It's a really nice region of the nighttime sky, but it is a very challenging target to see visually. You need to be in dark skies. You're gonna need an H beta filter or an O3, I'm sorry, a UHC filter or an H beta filter. And wider field, higher contrast is what you're looking for. Don't throw a lot of magnification on it, but that's what you need to be viewing the Horsehead um, Nebula. You can get a, a nice view if you've got a 10 or 12 inch telescope, but if you can get like a 16 or 20 inch, it becomes even easier. Um, and the darker the skies, the more helpful that becomes. But photographically, if you just got your little setup together or you just got your camera for the holidays, it shouldn't take a whole heck of a lot of work for you to capture a decent little image of the Horsehead Nebula. So that's IC434, the Horsehead Nebula. That's up in Orion. Um, so that's pretty much wraps up our hour for the most part. If you have any questions, now's the time to ask. Um, of course, if you like our webcast, you like what we're doing, uh, please go ahead and subscribe to our channel. If you've got any questions that maybe it didn't come up or you have an idea for a future episode or whatever comes to mind, you can email us at support at skywatcherusa.com. Title that What's Up webcast and we'll get to that. So uh, that's pretty much it for this week. Uh, we've got some cool stuff planned um, well into this year already. Uh, so do keep an eye. We're going to update our YouTube channel here shortly with probably the rest of the month's episodes. Um, I think we're talking about filters a little bit uh, coming up. Uh, more videos about like what filter to use for certain objects and how to understand which filter to use because we had some questions about that last year. Um, and then at the end of the month, we're going to have our friends from Star Arizona on. We're going to talk about some of their optics and accessories that they make for a variety of telescopes. And I think we're going to be showing something new uh, from them that works on Skywatcher equipment. So we're kind of excited for that as well. Um, so if you guys have any questions, now's the time to ask. Uh, I do hope you have a nice, clear, dark sky weekend. Uh, get out and start you know, shooting. Take advantage of the month. Uh, and the dark nights that we have right now. So um, we'll definitely, now is the time to get out and start viewing uh, for sure. If you've got some telescopes and some equipment, um, now's the time to go for that. Now, again, just to let you guys know, um, if you want a shirt or anything like that, we did open a threadless uh, t-shirt shop. Um, so we have all these different shirts that are available. Now you can kind of pick the size and the colors. Um, we'll be adding some more stuff as well in the future, but there's some cool stuff there. But that is our um, uh, th that is our Threadless store. It's uh, skywatcher.threadless.com. Um, so check, check that out. So uh, Star Arizona is the last Friday of this month. That would be the 29th, uh, January 29th. We're going to have uh, Steve Koenig and Scott Tucker uh, of Star Arizona. They're going to be on with us on uh, January 29th, talking about some of their accessories that they make, 
uh, for a variety of scopes and I think we're announcing a new uh, product that they're coming out with that works with Skywatcher telescopes. So we'll be, we'll be doing something fun with them at the end of this month as well. So definitely keep an eye out for that. Um, I don't see too many questions out there. Um, so I do appreciate all of you for being with us for our first episode back. Uh, we Please join us. This takes place every Friday, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, again, every Friday, unless there's a holiday or something like that. And we definitely enjoy you being here. It's fun hanging out with you guys on Friday. So come back next week. Join us. We're talking about visual filters. Uh, the topic on that really is covering... How do you know which filter to use for certain objects? Uh, last year we talked about kind of the science behind the filter. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about how to basically apply that and know what objects, what filters are ideal for because we had some people asking for that uh, last year. So uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you have a safe, dark weekend and uh, go out get those cameras out get those eyepieces and telescopes out hopefully you've got good weather uh, don't freeze uh, dress warmly if you can uh, but thank you for spending your friday morning with us uh, clear skies and i hope to see you guys all next week take care guys